What's happening all you people? Guess what? We're back to our old ways. We are truck casting. We're actually SUV casting right now. Uh, we're rolling in a Toyota 4Runner, which is pretty cool, man. I, is it okay to talk about the vehicle? You said that for Upland Hunters, that's not that big of a deal, right? I think... Um, this is Brian Coke with Ultimate Upland, by the way. And Mike Peeker introducing Mike Peeker. him. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I don't, some guys, I don't talk about their trucks in Upland. Like, I, I don't find it to be a, oh, you're talking about the, re, the oh, hot yeah, spotting being trucks. Being sneaky. Thing. Yeah. Hmm. No, yeah, I'm not saying that you don't like to, like, talk about how cool your vehicle is. Because, I mean, it's, it's a nice car. It's average. But yeah. uh, I don't, I don't know. I, I, for me, I don't, I don't know how to, how to even look at it that way. Because I don't, I don't hunt next to the road. But, yeah. you, but you usually do park next to the road. Yeah. So, if y'all don't know, that is the illustrious laugh of one brain kook, also known as Brian Coke, from Ultimate Upland, good friend of ours. We've been running around all over the upper Midwest. We also have Eric Gentry and Tyler Jones, Yo. who may y'all may know as being the actual part of the element, and I'm just a voice from time to time, but... <laughs> Uh, we are headed to Michigan right now to scout some whitetail, scout some rough grouse, scout some lesser yellow legs. Um, bears? And, are the bears going to be there or are we in a maybe, different part of the state? Uh, it's pretty far south, I think yeah. the area you're talking. So yeah. that'd be mm, maybe. Yeah. I'm not going to say no, but. Michigan is known. Do you know this? Michigan is known in some circles as being the toughest state to hunt whitetails. Did you know that? Why? That's a good question. <laughs> I don't... I, there's probably some guys who are, you know, yelling right now, but I don't really know why. Today, hopefully we'll see why, or maybe we'll disprove it. I don't know. Um, I think that maybe what they really mean is the toughest state to shoot a big buck, and that could be true. That, that very well... Because I feel like they have a very liberal... Uh, season, somewhat liberal gun season too, isn't that right? Like uh, they, they have the opportunity to shoot with guns. I think more than anything it comes down to the hunter population yeah. Uh, yeah, versus say, land yeah. mass. I oh, guess. you're saying pressure then? Yeah, but they, I think that there's going to be a high deer population. I just think age structure is an issue yeah. mm -hmm. in Michigan, but I'm uh, not sure of that. Well, the good, I mean, the good part about Michigan, I mean, from a rough grouse hunting, but it, probably also at deer hunting, is the amount of public access land is mm -hmm. immense. I mean, a lot of people think of the Upper Peninsula because literally, literally the bulk of the Upper Peninsula is access sure. to some regard or the other, but the yeah. truth is, is even down in the mitten, massive amounts of public access land. And for guys like you who are doing, you know, public deer hunting, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it, in that regard, I would just think it would be just almost perfect. So when you say it's tough, the rep is that it's tough to I don't know, kill a big deer or a deer. It just seems fascinating. To man, me. everybody except the blatantly obvious ones like to say, man, our state's the toughest there is. You know, like you name one outside of like Iowa or Illinois. Illinois, or maybe yeah, that's really about it, honestly. Um, like everyone else. Well, it, even if it's, it could be <clears throat> micro regional too, because like Ohio, which we have been in. Uh, a lot of people wouldn't say that about their state, but they might say, oh, I hunt this big, huge state forest in the southern portion of the state. That's the toughest hunting that there is, you yeah. know? Yeah, for sure. And so, like, people do like that whole, like, man, my hunting's the toughest kind of thing, yeah. you know? So and you think, just think it's a lens that the Michiganders are looking through going, yeah. our, uh, our deer hunting Not stuff? all of them. And, and they probably have a leg to stand on in some sense, but uh, there's a deer right over there. I think there's a heavy... Uh, deer hunting culture there and so with that uh, a lot of the percentage of the population accepts and does hunt and um, with that it just seems like everybody's in the woods during gun season and deer are dying and um, there's sure probably no passing of deer either and that's probably why you're not seeing yeah. big mm -hmm. bucks grows because you're probably not going to pass up there's yeah, not a lot of passing by. from what i understand and i would i think that also just being that michigan is kind of uh this peninsula or island almost in the north of the u.s it's kind of like well the deer are here and the people are here and we don't have a whole lot of space to expand maybe you know they kind of had that feeling that they're just kind of trapped in and mm -hmm. they and so everybody's just 
shooting deer or whatever. But we've but got I, a buddy named Sam Hogan who kills a lot of big public land bucks up here. Yeah. So it can be done. When we yeah. get up, up, up over that way, the feel and trap part, I think you guys are going to be like shot. I mean, I know there's lots of people, but we're going to get over that way. And because I've spent quite a bit of time up there hunting rough grouse, I feel like it's compared to Ohio, it's wide open, honestly. It, and that's my take. Oh, it'll be interesting, but you guys think wide open? What do you mean by more? it? Just feels like there's, Lots there's, of space. there's more area with less structures. Or, gotcha. I mean, it just feels like it to me. The human density is a little lower. It's wilder. To, to me, it feels like I could be. It could be distorted. Like, yeah. you know, in my lens, might be different. But yeah. when I go over to Michigan and hunt, it feels like it's just a, a better environment for hunting. You know, well, we ran like that this yesterday. Whole, my lens might be distorted thing. Yeah. I like this. Yeah, man, that's a this, humble We were take. hearing a whole lot of that from the front seat earlier uh, <laughs> yesterday. Not just you, but the front, the whole front section of the truck, yeah. you know. Um, we ran into that a little bit yesterday uh, when we went to Pennsylvania. We went to the Allegheny National Forest and did some map scouting there. Found some really cool stuff, but the whole time Tyler and I were both saying uh, how we thought it was going to be way wilder than what it actually was. Mm -hmm. Like, there was little camps vacation homes even big homes like throughout that thing yeah. you know i thought we were going up into the the hills you know yeah and uh it just didn't really have that wild feel it did whenever we kind of got back into some stuff but for the most part you were like within three miles of a house almost everywhere we went yeah you know? and less than a mile from a road yeah uh, or an unimproved road i'll say i won't necessarily you know it depends on what your definition of road is but yeah I, we I, had a big conversation road. yesterday too yeah, yeah it's tough well um, so what's your i want to go back to you said it's not the impression is not big bucks so what so give me what do, what do we talk in michigan oh uh, yeah I, I mean so what do you what what are your thoughts on what a big michigan buck would be i, I don't i mean you know me i don't do I don't sure. deer hunt, so I I'm think, curious what you guys say big in Michigan is or what you think it is. And I don't really know that for sure, but to me, I, I feel like um, Michigan has the genetic potential to grow some really big bucks. They have the, yeah. for the crops and everything. Especially but, southern. Crops yeah. and cover, man. And, and we're going to kind of go southern central today, I guess, is where we're going to be, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so kind of the palm of the mitten, right? Yeah, right in the center. So uh, you want that grounder to land. That's right. <laughs> and, but um, I would say it's more of an age class than it is antlers so like yeah. i think michigan has a hard time getting four and a half year old deer i think they have a hard time getting three and a half from or yeah. at least that's what i've understood yeah uh, like, i think most people would consider a three and a half year old northern buck to be a pretty big animal yeah okay and i think that uh the way i understand it, it from a lot of people that i've heard talk about it or talk to about it is uh you know two and a half year old bucks and less is kind of what they're seeing most of the time um a three-year-old gets shot pretty much almost throughout the state. Absolutely. To Understand. not divulge too much, one sort of famous podcaster once referred to this concept. Ooh. A mature buck in Michigan is, is a two-and-a-half-year-old deer because that's he referred to maturity as being relative. Yeah. Which, which is oh, very rel <laughs> relative maturity. Relative maturity. From what I understand, the bone structure oh, of the white tail. That's a fascinating idea. Matures I mean, in, in the four and a half year old age. Yeah, we're well, really five, but four and a half. There's like I've heard the bone done. structure stops growing in the four and a half year old age. I think that it's like ninety five percent. So it's mm -hmm. probably it's probably one of those things where like some do, some don't. Kind of kind of like you know how dudes are. Like I was, my bone structure was ninety five percent done in eighth grade. Mm -hmm. You know. So. Why are humans so much vastly different than animals? You know what I mean? Uh, like that. Like we have such. You and I walked into a convenience store earlier, and there was a dude that walked around the corner, and we were like, whoa, we that's both a were big like, dude. Yes. <laughs> like, man, is this yeah. guy XNFL or what? It's like if that was a deer, that's a 400-pound deer, you know? Yeah. I mean, but why don't those really – you don't see these – You know what I mean? I think it's because humans have uh, immigrated and immigrated all over the world, so we have a, a huge melting pot of genetic diversity – Whereas, like, in Michigan, they do have, I mean, I'm sorry, in Maine, they do have 400-pound whitetails, but those don't just randomly show up in, you know, northern Ohio in a convenience store. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so that I, guy I, is I, probably I, Germanic, you know, from, you know, his lineage or whatever, and they're huge. Nice no, Polish. He's, What's the yeah. heaviest whitetail ever weighed? I think whoa, it was whoa, whoa. ridiculous. I think it's in Michigan. It's like 466 or something like that. Or not Michigan. I keep saying Michigan. Maine. That's what I mean. 
What? So let me let me get this straight. Are we saying that relative maturity in whitetail is a thing, or are we saying no, it's not a thing? That is pseudoscience. No. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and then uh, we're we're sticking with that for people too. Oh, uh, because it sounded like you were just vouching for relative maturity in terms of you were well, mature in eighth grade we in, have a, to, in a physical sense. We have to think about this in ratios. Um, I don't know how to think about it because it's the first time I've ever heard the term, so I'm trying to understand. You know, you, you'll know how this works. Uh, you yeah, know, go, give dog, me a bird reference. Yeah, dog ears, which is which is kind of a anthropomorphic thing, anyways. But you, <laughs> you know what I'm saying about dog ears, right? So there, people like to say, "Well, dog, you know, one year for us and seven years for a dog, whatever." All that is is a ratio of saying dogs only live 10 to 12, 14 years yeah, old. Yeah, but relative maturity is a different thing. I know, than that. I know, I know. But let me finish my thought, yeah, and then good. maybe you'll understand what I'm saying. Um, a whitetail, if a whitetail were matured at two and a half for relative maturity, it would be as if a human matured at eight years old, as opposed to seventeen or eighteen, like like we do physically matured. You know what I mean? As opposed to like how like humans, we don't have a date range of between eight and twenty-eight where people physically mature. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, but there's a different rate, right? What do you mean? Well, you just said that you were physically mature at yeah, eighth but, grade. Yeah, but if you so. take the ratio down, that's the difference in a deer maturing and, like, with the bone structure in February of their fourth year oh. and in September of their fourth uh, year. I get it. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. So yeah. let me throw out a few facts here if y'all are done with that conversation. I like facts. Um, go, go. Back <clears> okay, so, well, these are, these are, I mean, I don't know what is a fact, you know, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> this uh, deer and deer hunting article talks about the heaviest bucks ever killed and Steve Bartilla. it looks like um, that the heaviest wild tail ever shot was killed by a bow hunter in Ontario the field deer field dressed 431 on a government government certified scale field dressed 431 estimated live weight would be more than 540 oh my goodness um, second place belongs to a 402 pound Minnesota buck um, Minnesota. that is dressed 402 pounds. Mm. Um, there is an another one from Maine. Um, 355 dressed. Fourth place, 321 from Wisconsin. And fifth place was uh, 291 dressed. That's a lot of variants. I know. I does feel like there's a lot it, of people not weighing their deer is the problem. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah but doesn't that inter interest you in some regard? Like, oh, absolutely. Why, is Maine on the list because there would be a way to kill a big buck in a different sense of the word? Oh, yeah. Actually, Maine hunters judge deer by their weight because they don't have good genetic antlers. Yeah, that's something Maine. that you guys would put on the list and go, that's something I'm, I'm, I'd am i be down to try and kill the biggest bodied animal. Oh, we were talking about this on the way up here. I would love to shoot a big body deer. I think that's fascinating just in terms I, I, you know, not, not being a big deer hunting guy, which is strange. You're not I, big. Yeah, you're not big at all. Yeah. Definitely these days. <laughs> but uh, relatively mature. Um, <laughs> We're trying to figure out how relatively. <laughs> oh, yeah. 60 or so. <laughs> but but I think it's, I've never heard of the this thing you just unleashed on me and that there's a different scale, literally a different scale of measuring big buck in a different part of the country. Uh, I think that's fascinating. Do you mean do you mean by the maturity scale? Is that what you're saying, or what are you no, saying? No, I'm saying that you're saying that people in Maine measure their deer's how big a deer is on uh, body weight. Yeah, it's cool. I've never heard anybody say that before. Yeah, mm -hmm. like I'm, I not you know I'm not, it's not like I haven't been around the outdoors. Mm -hmm. So that would make me go well. I want to. I mean, because everybody's so enthralled by the size of antler, uh -huh. I just would like go wow. I want to. I want to see. I want to see. I want to go do a body well, weight hunt. We, honestly, we yeah. do. Oh, wait, you want to go hunt a deer? Well, no, he's, I, he's I, hunting I'm for more body I, weight. If, oh. if I were, if I were, yeah, in I your uh, in your seat, we do that, but just not on quite that scale. Where I hunt we, for body weight after I kill a deer. I, I eat a lot of cookies. <laughs> <laughs> Donuts. Uh, <laughs> of course, we go to other states because the antlers are bigger. Yeah. But don't think that it is lost how much bigger the body size is. It's one of the things that we just marvel it's at. It's the first thing you notice, I oh, think, when you're from Texas that you, when you walk up on a deer. Because yeah, where we you're live, not passing on a – so this is an interesting thing. And I, I, um, you're not passing on a deer with big antlers because you could go, dang, there's a – possible possibility that there's a bigger body deer out in there. In some sense we do. Because they're like 
here's the here's the deal. This is tough. When you're a public land hunter, a lot of times you take whatever you can get because your encounters aren't high. But say, for instance, like um, some of Tyler, I'm not going to speak for you, but I'm I'm, I'm going to a little bit like some of Tyler's past hunting has been done on uh, a private lease in the Midwest, and what? they have uh, like a situation where sometimes they have two or three year olds two or three year old deer yeah. that have bigger antlers than the seven year old deer and like say for instance in 2015 Tyler shot a deer that they named one eyed jack that was a huge bodied big old buck but was like a low 150s type buck probably something probably, like that maybe maybe and that was his biggest year he was, was he may have made the 150s but there's that's, probably, on, that's on YouTube though right yes. that, yeah, yeah I think, I think I've seen there's, that there's, there was probably a four year old on the lease that year that scored more than him oh, yeah. right? there was yeah. several deer that year that were Bigger than bigger younger, than but bigger animals. Yeah. So you made that decision, but it was that wasn't a conscious decision on body weight. It was an age thing. Like you'd seen, you'd track that deer. Yeah, right? I would say yeah. body weight is probably kind of a. We're trying uh, to let them hit factor. that relative maturity. Maturity. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, th this whole thing is 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 news to me. But I, I mean, I just wonder, if, you know, how high on the list it would be to go, you know, try and kill the biggest body deer. I guess what. Year. What's the definition of maturity, though? Because you can use maturity in a couple different ways. Well, I don't think deer mature, like, socially. Too because much, that right? deer's antlers were, were at seven, were the biggest uh, that they ever were. Mm -hmm. um, does that make it finally a mature rack? Is the rack finally matured? I think most people consider maturity in bone structure. That's what they're actually talking about. Yeah. You know? Well, socially they mature too, isn't that? That's your yeah, sort of, but yeah. that's like within the first couple years. You don't think you don't think well, a, a smart old buck learns in a, in a social that's sense true. more? That's true. I mean, they get harder to hunt, so you would think case, that they're getting better, right? Well, maybe I don't know. I'm I'm asking. I mean, you know, open ended. I don't know if that is, could you call that maturity because uh, Bill Winky, who is one of the guys I respect the most, says that deer after about six get easier to hunt when you're on private land when he's in a controlled environment because he says at that point in time their home range starts to shrink and they become very habitual and in that six and seven age range they are easier to kill than well they it's are like old four. people are easier to kill too yeah. right like but, an old i mean, I mean that's andrew Cuomo, I, I mean, right i mean that, uh, uh, that's all i mean but is it that you that you that's kind of a, a skewed thing because a six or seven year old deer is like a uh, elderly right like, yeah. like, well, it's well, like no no, no. Deer not are quiet. not like us. They do not get old and fat and like just bad shape because they don't. That's wait. Deer's teeth wear down to nothing, just like old people. Sure, right? yeah. but that's like at thirteen or yeah. twelve. Yeah. Oh, I, I'm well. Okay, yeah, I, I understand. Maybe I had the years wrong, but yeah. I'm just saying like at six or seven, are they on the? They're on the decline. No, not dude, usually. they're like a ripped up Sylvester Stallone at sixty so, at that point in time. Yeah, my well, maybe not even that age, you know? Because yeah. my, I mean. My um, yeah, you're 60, right? So, my my wife's uncle has a place that they hunt down in South Texas, and they don't they try not to shoot deer until they are seven. Huh. So they say that that and this South Texas is literally where, you know, quality deer management was started. Um, this is a place there the highest you know biggest money in the world for deer hunting tends to go South Texas. And so they spend the most money and research down there on deer, and they say that seven is when m most of the deer have had enough time to fully develop body and uh, antler-wise. Okay, but to circle back to the social thing with deer, even though we get the guy that you respect goes at six or seven, they get easier to hunt. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> that doesn't mean that the deer isn't learning. It means learning more. It doesn't mean that the deer has actually learned how to better conserve. And I mean, you know, like it, it seems to me that that's not the deer de learning. It's de learning, de -learning in terms of hunting. But yeah. isn't that deer learning, still learning to better use its own resources? Well, here's, yeah. I think here's the question that's is, why the is mature. Is. Is that a finish line, or is mature a process that you never finish? That's, it, that's exactly right. Really this is what I was conceptual. saying when I was saying you have to define maturity. Yeah, because yeah, I got you, I got technically, you. A, I mean, your personality throughout your whole life, and the same as a deer, is going to probably change here and there. I mean, shot that buck Frankenstein, you know, that was tw probably 12 years old, we figured at least. Yeah, he um, was geriatric. I mean, he was literally, he was super habitual, but still moving long distances, but like, 
also he would run downhill because he was kind of arthritic and would just like you could tell he was limping just from you know being old and just he would run downhill because he couldn't have didn't have the muscle mass to stop himself so you know, kind of like brian but so his bone structure exactly like me <laughs> but his bone structure only one of us got up and worked out this morning by the way um <laughs> in this car the oldest one um but uh that 12 year old deer frankenstein that video is up too right yeah so uh bone structure uh are we talking about skeletal bone structure or are we talking about antler structure would have been on a decline huh yeah the antler structure would be on a decline in that case um, and the skeletal structure as well i mean you, you would probably yes. say it's all the same right i nah. i would assume it's pretty close i feel as if antlers are not bones but, what about bone collector? Yeah, I know, right? But, uh, right. This, I was. I just saw a truck pass us not too long ago with that sticker on it, yeah. and I was like, mm, "Okay, but what? Uh, so, what? Give me the breakdown on that, I guess. I mean, if you Antlers, want to, you don't have to walk me down that path. And but I'm no biologist, right? But it, from my understanding, antlers are kind of a halfway point between bones and keratin structure, like your fingernails. <laughs> Is that? I have no clue. Yeah. So I, I've always thought I mean, of them as a bone that yeah, oh, but there's no, there's no marrow in an antler, but the, the, it's uh, kind of like uh, not hard antler. There isn't like a, a soft uh, a, a in velvet antler. I don't know. I think all there's the, blood flow going through there, yeah, right? I don't know. Somebody might have to. I'm, I probably shouldn't speak from a point of knowledge on this. Well, if it's like a fingernail, how about that? Um, when people are stuffed in coffins, don't their fingernails keep growing? Is that a no? No, see, no, no, no I'm pretty sure that's that. a real thing. How do, yeah, well, how do you know? Um, I used coffins. to work in a cemetery. <clears throat> did you? Yeah. And you no, you up? didn't. Yeah, did. did you really? I did. Yeah, but how, how how do you know that their fingernails kept growing? I don't. I just wanted to. Just I just wanted to wallets. bring that in there. <laughs> I just wanted to bring the fact that I've worked in a cemetery. <laughs> so would you like me to tell you one of Tyler's uh, white tail fantasies? Uh, mm. I'm not sure, but maybe. <laughs> it is too. Like, to can, we can always delete it, right? Can we, can we drop a, some ludicrous music to, right here, please? <laughs> to kill a buck in a cemetery. Uh oh. Well, right? so, yeah. So there's potential right for the, that right in a edge. few places out west because some family cemeteries sit mm -hmm. on public access. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not truly public ground, but public access. So that would be potential. I know. We've seen some stuff like that. We saw something in Illinois like that, I think, too. Yeah. Um, there's some stuff. I mean, just South Dakota would have something like that, too. Mm, mm, may, yeah, no, that that's that's true. Yeah, because I remember passing a cemetery. I took a, I took a, uh, this will sound more, but my mom is trying to have me come up with what her headstone's going to look like. Yeah, my parents are old. I think it's um, just be like a, your head. I t and I was taking a picture of one of the headstones which was on a piece of public access where we were uh pheasant on. oh yeah yeah huh yeah well i don't know that it would be ideal for deer i think that's the problem with that fantasy is the intersection of good deer habitat and that cemetery would be really that'd be a hard thing to find but it'd be really cool i mean it's out there i'm sure in some of the more midwestern states a lot of times cemeteries are kind of a a clearing in a wooded area it's a good spot to find scrapes yeah, there's also green grass there. Mm -hmm. The other way you could look at it in the Midwest, uh, what we we're talking about at my house, um, is how um, it, w they, they give out, no, it's not nuisance permits, but you can hunt within city limits mm -hmm. be because it, there's, you know, the deer population close to the National Park is just skyrocketing. So they have to, get them, they have to control the population somehow. So Why? The, the interesting part would be, well, no, right. I mean, just let them go. Um, Preservation. Right. Preservation. I'm all for it. Um, but you might be able to find a city where you could actually hunt in city limits and have that be the point. That probably is the most has the most potential. I'm, I'm really looking forward to a time when I can work a little less than I do right now so I can focus on things that are fun like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> Not that I don't focus on things that are fun, but like there are some cool things that I think, oh, this would be cool to do. Like go hunting with Brian on the Missouri River. You yeah. know, like I want to do that. But I know that that time of year um, right now, this, you know, to be a very hip season of my life, I'm not able to go do that with you, but I would love to at some point. So yeah, hopefully, but, but you, you're part of your normal work. You could just go to Maine and try and kill the biggest body deer on record. <laughs> Definitely could. It's just the issue is actually doing that because if you don't, then nobody cares. Work harder, right, Casey? Yeah. Oh yeah. 
Work harder. Absolutely. <laughs> Nobody cares. Where, that's why Brian got up this morning and told us all about his workout. <laughs> I didn't tell you about it. He did. I come said on. I was going for a hike. No, you come asked me. Yeah. But you I still didn't tell me. you. <laughs> I, 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 I didn't go tooting my horn. You were asking, homeboy. But you, you told me. Uh, right. If you, if you had a true humble nature, you'd be like, ah, what's true that? True humble nature. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what I'll do. Uh, I did. I asked Brian because I was interested to see what he did. Um, Brian is a humble guy. He is. Brain. Uh, <laughs> Brain. He right. Brain so, cooked us some waffles, chicken waffles last night. They were so man. good. They, they were so waffles. good. Cooked us a steak with, um, uh, what are those things? Ramps? Yeah. Ramp butter. Ramp butter. Oh, What's man. going over here with this huge so Florida weave? Stuff. Is that a pepper farm? Oh, yeah. So western, northwestern Ohio, um, the ag there is uh, stuff you'd see in other parts. The the soil out here changes and it gets more sandy in this part. And uh-huh. so there's there there are farms that grow tomatoes. Like Heinz has got oh. uh, commercial uh, contracts with some of these guys. Uh, cucumbers, I know for sure. I bet they don't have one. any deer problems. Those look like peppers. I'm telling you, like, it, 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 it could have been. I don't wild. know all of them, but I, um, and they had Florida weave across every row in that. 60 acres right there the the um the, the weird part about watching them harvested on on machines have you seen any of that stuff like i haven't seen it in person but i've seen like videos there they, there they, there there's it? a guy like leaning over like pulling them and putting yeah. on a conveyor belt but yeah, yeah there's a heinz has some um has some uh facilities out here where they're where they're processing them and it's it's not just it's ketchup and relish and all kinds of stuff i assume but huh. the the yeah it's, it's big stuff out this way well, it's not so just, not joking it What's the percentage of the population here that has a German last name? And you and Steve both do. How do you spell joke? How do you spell joke? Is that with one O or two? <laughs> I don't know. J U K. And that strange symbol. Yeah. The German symbol. <laughs> two dots. But I mean, it's it's real heavy German, huh? It just depends on what part of Ohio. Oh. Uh, well, I mean, we're still Heinz is German, but. Yeah, it, yeah, it is. Anyways, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, so that's interesting. Let's talk about your hunt a little bit because we just I just alluded to it, but uh, you have a pretty, pretty awesome hunt that you're wanting to do this year. Is this something we can talk about much? Or are you trying to keep people from stealing this from you? Um, I, I rarely, I'm, I, you know, can somebody jump in and try and do it before I do it uh, this fall? Maybe. Um, there's some companies with money that could probably put some. Yeah, bird I don't. I don't know. I don't. It's just, so you're gonna you're gonna release this podcast next week, right? Probably soon. Yeah, maybe uh, more. We ain't gonna talk about it then. Too, right. too early. Too, they still got a month. They can they can activate. I mean, it's it's gonna be great. You know, I will. I'll come back on after. Let me ask you this then. The, you have you do this you do a cool trip like every year, man. Uh, like I guess kind of a big trip or whatever, for lack of a better term. Uh, in the past, it's been. 14ers we've talked about that a little bit we may talk about it a little bit more here in a second but you have had in your 60 years quite a bit of experience and um, you are very uh, you think about things a lot and deeply and I just feel like I, I don't know if I can imagine there being another bird hunter out there like you are there other guys out there that like are like you that have the experience that you have or do you feel like and this is a chance to be you know i don't want you to be humble and say oh well yeah there's you know i'm not the best or whatever like i truly feel like as far as upland hunting goes like if i uh if i was just a general public person and i knew what you had done and where you've been and all i would i would go to you with any question about upland hunting do you feel like there are other guys out there like you I, I don't I, I mean I, I hate to say probably not but it's probably not just because that's how I feel too though I feel like as you guys know I'm more I'm just basically only ate up with upland birds like there's there's other guys who are are versed in upland hunting well versed and have uh, accomplished depending on what your definition of accomplished is but um, that but they also do other things mm-hmm. you and, have from what I can have seen at least you have two framed pictures of Bob White Quail in your house and one guinea fowl painting. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and there's probably more 
There's a picture quail. of a grouse in the living room. I saw. Oh, you that's took what that. it is. It's one bob and one grouse. That's right. And yeah. then, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, and the, and well, the other thing that um, the feathers on the wall are all my first birds across every grouse uh-huh. species, uh-huh. except for one, which is lacking. Yeah. There's a story behind that, but it bored, bored most of your listeners. Every North American grouse species, I'm assuming. If you don't count ptarmigan, but yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but I would say, to echo what Tyler said, um, maybe you're not the best upland hunter, but you've done the mo- the coolest stuff of any, you know, like you, and you've gone and done it. You know, who knows what best means when it comes to upland hunting. It's kind of like mature, right? Like it's like, well, how do you, how do you determine that? Is it the best shot? Is it the guy who knows the most about where birds are? You know, who knows, right? Best but dog as trainer, far as like whatever. experience, I used to kind of talk about this a lot yesterday, and it's funny that we were debating. I'm sorry, I said that wrong. <laughs> it was funny. I, I, it was I, I used statement. to talk about this a lot, and yesterday we were debate. I was debating the opposite side of the couch here, um, but I used to and still somewhat do consider myself an experienced hunter. Like I, I'm looking for the experience much more than I am the means to an end um sure but i feel like you take that to good extremes yeah i i take it to a strange level i don't know if i feel pressure for that i i, I guess i do feel pressure for that and i don't necessarily know why mm-hmm. um i'm a, uh in some ways i'm dr- i'm a i mean probably in many ways i'm driven by uh, uh, a sense of competition I don't know why that, you know, I guess I always have been. I'm easily motivated by uh, competition. You're one of those people who's in competition with themselves, which are the most dangerous types of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's where I've kind of, I want to, it's turned that way, but I also can turn on people pretty quick. (laughs) Point point me in a direction, like, you know, know, push the wrong button and point me in a direction. Like the fat buck challenge or whatever y'all are doing right now? Yeah, yeah, like, (laughs) I can get wound up pretty easy, Um, so... You know that, and that translates into my bird hunting, and and it also translates into conservation for me. It really, it translates into a lot of stuff. I don't, uh, you know, it's just I guess it's the way I'm I'm I'm, I'm woven. I can't can't undo it at this point because I'm just, you know, six. When you're 60 years old, it, it's, yeah. it's it's tough <laughs> yeah. to learn new tricks. Let me ask you this: um, a lot of people consider Michael Jordan, and or it doesn't matter for this example. If you consider LeBron James being the best basketball player ever of all time, whoever it is, yeah, um, those guys are known worldwide. If you, and I'm saying this, I consider you as being one of the best probably bird hunters that exists. If you are, how come nobody knows who you are? <laughs> <laughs> I, I I don't know. Uh, it's not popular. Um, bird hunting isn't. You're saying uh, it, the bird hunting in general is not popular. The truth is, is that the average upland hunter, and we've had some of these conversations, but the average upland hunter, mm-hmm. and I I'd be hard pressed to call them upland hunters, but we you know because again you know, the definition, but the average guy only hunts two times a year. They hunt on opening weekend at whatever state, and then uh, and then they. They hunt on a holiday with their family, mm. and there's nothing. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it's just it's not the you know it, upland birds and upland hunting is not in the front of most people's minds. So yeah. out of 11.5 million hunters in this country, then that number fluctuates and is going down. By the way, regardless of what year, um, out of those 11.5 million hunters. Um, Maybe 900,000 of them, maybe a, a, a scad bit more would be, or would call themselves upland hunters. Mm-hmm. So 900, I got 900,000 people. Why don't all 900,000 know me? Well, I'm probably offensive to 450,000 of those <laughs> 900,000 people. Because uh, yeah. I've always been, uh, I tell people I'm a black and white guy. Like, uh, um, uh, there's no middle ground for me. It's 50-50. Yeah. Uh, uh, not in my operation. It's just like literally... Uh, I've been this way all my life. Like fifty percent of people can tolerate me, and then fifty percent of fifty percent of people hate me. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I got four hundred fifty thousand people, and uh, out of those, two hundred thousand actually on YouTube. So, yeah, yeah I'm not. This a, is not that. I didn't mean to say nobody knows you yeah. either, because there you have some people that really do care about it that follow and watch your videos, and you know are going to listen to this podcast and uh, hopefully subscribe. But uh, you know, like I guess in. Re- you know, we're talking about relative maturity earlier. We're going to talk about relative to MJ. You know, uh, oh, this yeah. is a lot smaller market, right? Sure. You know, so 
Uh, and then your, uh, I guess, uh, integrity is probably another thing that makes it difficult for people to find who you are, right? Because um, yeah. you don't see a whole lot of dead bird pics on your Instagram. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I, I would, I, except for that one where you spelled out 150 in pheasants. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? yeah. That grounds on me. <laughs> yeah. that's, one of my, that's one of my, oh, that's a nightmare. I, gives it, I just like, that's like nails on a chalkboard right there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, the, part of the problem is it's this, uh, uh, I, you know, it's, it's I, I've, I've put myself in my own purgatory, which is I don't want to play by the game that makes things popular, you know? Like, I, I, just, I just refuse to no matter what. I just I can't bring myself to do it. And then that makes me uh, hard to relate to um, because, because the way I'm doing things, so we can talk about... We can talk about last season. We can't talk about what's coming up last season. I haven't released Way Up Land season two, but so I call these trips Way Up Land. You guys know that. Yep. Not very many mm-hmm. other people know that. I, my my big my big quote unquote challenging trip. I've, I've termed it Way Up Land. That's where it started with the 14ers. But last year I I biked uh, across the Missouri National Grassland on a fat bike, towing a trailer with my dogs, hunted the entire way. It's an it's an insane thing to do, and um, just in in terms of nobody else does it. Now, there's a faction of people out there that find it cool. There's also a pretty broad faction of people that just are just like, well, I I would never do that. That's stupid. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and and so where's I your, don't know. Yeah. Where's your trailer? Right? Where are you bringing trailer? Yeah. <laughs> like, what are you doing? Without your without offending to people, why can't you just go write stories for uh, outdoor life on this? Because that's kind of you know, that's where you used to you heard about trips and stuff like that. You know, that, yeah. That, but outdoor life knows their market, and they also know that that the bird, upland bird hunting. You know how many how many stories are in outdoor life about a, a upland bird hunting in a year? And, and, uh, yeah, and there's not many about what you did though. I yeah. mean, that's my thing. Is like I just. Um, I don't know. People need to know about what you're doing. It's cool, dude. It's it's well, awesome. So I'm not probably don't fall under the classification as upland hunter like you, what we talked about like the average upland hunter for sure not right and maybe even not upland hunter at all but i enjoy what you do and i appreciate it and i think a lot of people would do you think that one of the reasons that you don't have like a huge following is that you haven't bought into the outdoor tv model do you think that there's a world where you can just get an outdoor tv spot and just get it out there and people be like oh wow i didn't know <sighs> you know because I, I can tell you this. I remember one guy ever in my life. Like I, I don't even know the names of famous upland hunters, right? Yeah. But you, do you know who I'm fixing to talk about? He had he had kind of like a flat rim type hat, and he had a setter dog, and he would drop, he would go to different places. Hunting with Hank. Is that who that is? That was the name yeah, of the yeah, dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hank's the name of the dog. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that guy kind of has a mustache kind of guy, yeah. right? Well, there's another guy, Scott Linden. He's one of the more famous guys. He has had a television show and yeah. has had a television model. And that's the only reason like, I even knew what Upland Hunting was, was because of the outdoor TV. Yeah. I, I, I mean, if the question is, is could I bring myself to do that? Yeah. Um, not at this point. Mm. Um, I just, I can't. So, for, I know your audience probably doesn't know this and maybe, maybe doesn't care, um, but... Almost all those shows that you see on television for upland hunting, upland hunting being quail and pheasant for most people, there's other species, I won't delve too deep into that, lots of other species by the way, but most people recognize quail and pheasant as upland hunting. The bulk of the shows that you see on television are canned hunts. Mm. Think of high fence deer hunting in the in the worst possible way you could possibly think of high fence deer hunting. <laughs> I literally mean the worst possible way. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it, the twenty-acre pen stuff. It, it, I mean, I'll let you guys tell me what that is, and then, but to, to tell you what it is in the upland world, or the upland preserve world, and you've heard from Steve when he was <laughs> there. Steve calling right now. <laughs> I just said his name, and Whoa. Wow. that was weird. That right? was weird. Um, I'll call it back later. So. Um, Steve, my but my buddy Steve, we well, you guys see his content or anybody, <laughs> not a lot, but a few guys see his <laughs> Some content. <people. laughs> but he's a guide. Uh, he's an upland guide to train his dogs, right? What an upland guide at one of these preserves does is, um, Tyler and Casey said something to Steve about, well, you go, you you put the birds out the night before or something to him, and he's like, no, I literally 
plant the birds an hour before we hunt. Mm -hmm. So these are pin raised pheasant or pin raised quail or pin raised checker. Oh boy, um, <laughs> that that are um, and half the time the birds are are dizzied. Essentially, you you put them in a sack you, or whatever. You shake the bird until it's, uh, it's so dizzy, and then you tuck its head under its wing. And if you sit it in the grass, that way it will be there, no matter what. <laughs> so, um, so the shows you're watching on television are preserved birds, uh, pin ray stuff, uh, and and. It's because filming up a uh, moving targets, upland flying birds. It's it's just tough to pull that all together from yeah. from a photography and vid videography perspective. Need a lot of chances to get that on film. Need a lot of chances to get that on film. Yeah. And so, you know, they're they're using these dizzy birds at preserves, and 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 it's just for me, so, it's, it's so different from what a wild bird hunt is. It's offensive to my senses. Yeah. But you can produce your show however you'd like. This to. is kind of what I was about to say. Yeah. Is like, okay, so there's everybody knows the meat eater model, right? It sure. started out on this a little bit different, you know, than the outdoor TV typical model, right? Where, uh, you know, at first maybe guys were not real sure what to think because you know this guy kind of didn't really show a lot of hunting and showed more of like preparing a meal afterwards or whatever. Is there a is there a way to do that? Is it worth your time and money, and or do you need money behind that, or what's the you know what's stopping you from doing that? Well, the meteor model that's interesting because you know meteor model somewhat starts with a Netflix show being picked up and other things. You know, I mean today's meteor model is a little bit different, but yeah. it's still yeah, based sure. on the fact that a Netflix show was picked up. You know, in a hunting scenario. Mm -hmm. um, is there a way to to so so was that a television model or was that a streaming television model? I don't. I mean, there was still money behind it enough to carry a cameraman around and stuff like that. You know, true. somehow. So like, this these are things that would be difficult for you in producing your own show. Would be man, I'm going to pay a camera guy that knows what the heck he's doing to go on these crazy trips where. Frankly, the one that we talked about yesterday that you're going to do this year, I asked you, you know, we kind of joked. I was like, you don't think you're going to die or something. You took you a second to answer that one, you know? Yeah. So, like, these aren't just uh, run-of-the-mill, you know, getting and, a side-by-side uh, and, -side and drive out in the field kind of thing, you and know? That's the exact, and that's the exact problem. Um, uh, and, and, and it's not a problem that can't be overcome. But the truth is, is can I find a cameraman to follow me up uh 17, 14,000 foot mountains actually carrying gear and getting me hunting or maybe or maybe or maybe not getting a bird and literally watching me descend into some level of insanity mm. while he's uh, uh, you know videoing, videoing it's engaging for me to say it like that but is a guy or a woman or anybody quite frankly going to do yeah. that you could find somebody, but you're going to have to pay them a lot. You ain't going to find an intern to do it. No. Yeah. You know. <laughs> no, you're not. Yeah. yeah. That's or at least a, I one think, that'll stick around. Yeah. 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 That's the, that's, I think that's one of the, the you issues. You guys know the challenge of, of getting good help. Yeah. <laughs> we right, can't Eric? find them. Well, I mean, where, where are they? <laughs> I know. <laughs> no, Eric's killer, man. He's, uh, you know, for those who are watching right now, which, by the way, this is a video podcast as well. So those who are watching, this is Eric right here, and he is just knocking it in the head out here on these map scout challenges he's going to shoot his first buck with a bow this year it's going to be exciting <laughs> can't wait <laughs> it's going to be awesome he's uh he's learning a lot he's kind of a newer hunter uh we've talked about that with you on a podcast i think so far mm -hmm. um, so yep. a lot of people might be familiar uh, but um on these map scout challenges the last couple of days is there anything that's been anything that stuck out to you that you're like um that you took note of or that surprised you or kind of what's your whole vibe here for um, a word that yesterday likes. i was telling you about how when we were going up that steep hill in pennsylvania yesterday mm -hmm. i thought it was interesting how because back home when i have a place that i hunt that it, it's not obviously as steep and as you know elevation wise it's not as high but mm -hmm. we still have some pretty rigid stuff and i found it interesting that it seemed like the deer were still moving about halfway up that hill, you mm -hmm, know, mm -hmm. and it's ju kind of just like back home. Yeah. So it's kind of like that's what KC talks about all the time. Is like deer do deer stuff. So that's one thing we can go and do all this stuff. Like this is kind of stuff that is out of our element, if I could use a funny statement, punny statement. Um, but 
the the thing is that Casey always talks about is like deer do deer stuff. They just have different habitats and different yeah. places that they they live, right? So there are things that we can always say these this is this is what a deer will do because it's a deer. And so we can go to Ohio or Pennsylvania, and I think one of those things is like you said, the elevation. You know, like um, wherever there's elevation, they're still using using that similarly. You know, mm -hmm. and we find that like for us a lot, creeks, creek bottoms, are uh, you know uh, parallel uh, parallel to trails. Essentially, they're a highway for deer to use a lot of a lot of times. Um, and so you know, anywhere we go, the creek bottom is typically a pretty decent place to find a white-tailed deer. So there's some cool things, you know, that we can we can use in these map scout challenges that uh, help us to find deer in new habitat. And, and frankly, the Pennsylvania stuff was quite different than anything we've done. Um, I I could have I could have stayed out there all day and just done the whole nature hiker thing. You know what I mean? Oh, I know y'all yeah. felt the same. I mean, we sat there looking at milkweed with pollinators all over it for 20 minutes yesterday, just taking pictures and talking and watching these little bugs go nuts in there. I was and, laying in it. Yeah, you were laying <laughs> in it. You spent some time laying down in it, and then for the rest of the day, you scratched for ticks. Uh, oh, and also look up ticks. spotted red eft. Yeah. If yeah. you guys want a fascinating story in, in wilderness not related to deer, spotted red eft. You have to look at that thing. It the he spelled eft. E f t. I thought you spelled it differently though. Uh, uh, <laughs> Is there a nature there? F u t. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, that 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 uh, I, I'm still fascinated by that story. Yeah, I looked at I looked because I, I knew something about them, but we they have saw, a neurotoxin, we saw two right? Yesterday, yeah, oh, dude, and it's like deadly neurotoxin. Yeah, I, yeah, I, they're the same color as those jack o' lanterns. Casey was I, touching them. Super crazy though, uh -huh. man. I, it's it's a it, the the neurotoxin is super deadly apparently. A lot yeah. fast, and they and they become less toxic as they age. They totally transform as they get older. Just like a, they're just as they mature, right? As they mature, relatively they get less toxic. mature. Relatively, relatively, as they mature, the relative relatively. maturity determines their toxicity. It's kind of like a snake. You know, the little ones that bite you, they can't Actually, control their venom. So, uh, they are poisonous, correct? Well, you would the say Fs? venomous. No, venomous means that they, they will bite you. If you eat an eft or lick it, you're probably going to die. What if you touch an eft and he p pushes some what if poison you, out? What if you glands? touch an eft and then lick your fingers? Because I was thinking about that. I'm still here. And I, I, I was trying to. I was trying to think about how many times you licked your fingers in the woods. I don't do that a lot. <laughs> because I'm kind of the guy who touches a lot of stuff. So I've kind of yeah. learned. Don't put your fingers in your mouth. Y'all touched every mushroom you saw yesterday. Oh, that's like. 100 percent true. And how many species of mushrooms did we see? Uh, Lots. Over 20. Yeah. E I'd say easily, right? right? Yeah. I mean, it's tough to tell because they change with mm -hmm. the with the station, you know, how, how how mature they are. Yeah. But I mean, I'd say I found the coolest one. Just Brian to likes to you two did. horn. Brian likes to do this thing where he's like, oh. That one's edible for sure. I don't, I don't know, <laughs> but that's an edible mushroom, and, which is a very dangerous game to play. Yeah. Both, both in uh, you know in actuality and in just uh, fun statements because uh, it might be. But man, alive. we did take some home to eat though. We ate chanterelles last night, and they were awesome. That's true. Yeah. Well, so for clarity's sake, I've been hunting morel mushrooms my entire life in okay. the Midwest. Morel and mushrooms is a very small segment of the fungus world. But there's I guess. nothing in the world that looks like a morel mushroom. It is uh, its well, own Well, false thing. morels are in the ballpark, but not. I mean, not not really. Close. But you can eat a false morel, and it's not a big deal. It won't kill you. It'll make 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 you not feel so hot. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Here right. we go. Mm. Um, but so. Last year, I started expanding my fungus knowledge a little bit, and uh, and Casey's ate up with it. Um, <laughs> and, and Casey's got a friend, in, uh, a wildlife officer friend in Texas, I believe, who's ate up with it. He does. And yeah. uh, and and so now I like every mushroom seems like it should be something you can eat. We got chanterelles up here for sure. I found a bunch last year. I didn't necessarily prepare them the well, best way. Well, when you say for sure. <laughs> No, no, the I, 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 okay, yeah, I was eighty-two percent sure on the mushrooms I found last year, and I didn't get sick eating them. Yeah, so, so the with chanterelles, there are there are really three options when you see something that looks like a chanterelle. Yeah. There are jack o' lantern mushrooms which you climbed a fence for a legal fence. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But you climbed a, and this is a whole other thing. But 
uh, there are, for some reason are high fences, like eight six foot, foot, eight foot exclusion yeah. fences yeah. in the woods in Pennsylvania. You and find it's sketchy one of those, to climb over, by yeah, the way. Because you thought that there's a possibility that these might be chanterelles. Yeah, because they of big cluster. Yeah, they end up being jack o' lantern mushrooms, which are Spooky. more orange yeah. and have gills. Which, and, what are those? And have, uh, so, yeah, the difference between uh, gills are like when you look under a common toadstool, it's the thing that uh, looks like grows a... Portobello's have them. Yeah. When you, look, yeah, yeah. when you look under a mushroom and it's got these little flappy things, yep, yep. those are gills. Those are gills. And they run from the stem, which I don't think it's called a stem in mushrooms, uh-huh. out to the cap. Yeah. Out to the end of the hood. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's what jack lanterns have. And at night, apparently they have a tiny glow. Which makes me want to go back out I there know. and look at that mm. thing at night, I know, man. dude. Yeah, do you do long exposure on that? Yeah. Oh, that'd be that'd cool. That'd be fire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> literally. Yeah. Yeah. Literally. Uh, yeah, and then so they, but the chanterelles don't have gills. They have what you call veins. Yeah, right. It looks like your, uh, looks like my mom's leg. I was gonna say your mom's <laughs> leg, but I won't go there. <laughs> There's that. It's kind of. It looks. I would describe it more like, um, like if you stuck your neck out real far and then flexed it and you went e, yeah. and like all those uh, yeah. tendons kind of show that's kind of what they look like underneath but then there's a middle ground jack-o'-lanterns will make you very very sick and maybe hallucinate chanterelles are delicious and there's a middle ground that we that's the one we struggled with the most yesterday are the false chanterelles yeah because or, or i think they're called false chanterelles yeah. right yeah. yeah so um they look just like a chanterelle feel like one don't smell much different than a chanterelle, but you turn them over and there's still gills in there. But sometimes the gills aren't that developed. Yes. And then that's where it gets to be this really so, strange line. For an amateur like me, it's just like, okay, I'm not going to pick any tiny chanterelles because that's the way <laughs> they got to be big. If yeah. they're big, then there's no way. But the thing with a, a fall chanterelle, Tyler looked this up last night, they're just bitter. They're just bitter. But, so, they but if you, you cut them into rough pieces and cook them all in the same saute skillet, you're going to end up with <laughs> figuring out you, the whole thing is ruined pretty much. Maybe. You know? Or maybe last night or we just. Or maybe we found a way to make them all wonderful. That's right. Maybe. I don't know, but I remember yesterday at the end, for sure, I picked some false ones, and we looked at them and decided, no, yeah. that's not a good. Absolutely. But, so, either way, we had our first chanterelles yesterday, Tyler, Eric, and I, and they are absolutely Man. worth picking. Yes. Oh, my Butter, gosh. salt, and a skillet. Kind of low heat, right, Brian? Yeah, low to medium. Uh, chanterelles got a lot of moisture in them, and so you're trying to concentrate that flavor, So, and I don't want the butter to burn while you're concentrating the flavor. Mm-hmm. That's in my mind. If somebody's going to look at this and go, this guy did not have fixed chanterelles at all. Um, it's not, like I said, I'm new to the chanterelle thing, but I want to tell you what, it worked out pretty good last night. They can night. say yeah. what they Man. want because improving on that is going to be hard. Yeah, oh, yeah. For sure. It's tough. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I think that the the simple preparation for a lot of foraged things is a good deal. You know, like when it comes to blackberries or anything like that, like a simple preparation allows those flavors of nature to kind of come through. You know, and that's well, and exactly what you said what last was. night when we put it in the skillet, because in case you put the rough chop on them th- and threw them in the butter while I was working on the um, chicken and waffle stuff. and. Uh, you said, well, your gut feeling would be to throw in some, some onion with them. And I was like, yeah, but you guys want the full chanterelle mm. experience, not the chanterelle and onion experience, yeah, you sure. know, yeah. at least for the first go around. Yeah. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm sure there's plenty of ways to fix them, but that oh. way was pretty good. I mean, I'd do it every time, man. Oh, yeah. I, mean. I, I think that was pretty killer. I think that maybe if you used uh, um, um, some shallots. Something a little bit less, or you could do chanterelles and ramps, ramps. Mm. which are kind of like a shallot. It's different seasons, though. That's the problem. I'd have to set. You'd have to save enough ramp but to. We had ramps last night I, that were fresh, so no, you have to save it. No, I saved them from the spring. I learned, That's what I'm saying. Yeah, but you could. Yeah. yeah. Man, the um, uh, I meant to tell you that the, the so we found enough to actually um, dehydrate some for uh, KC to take back to Texas. Maybe it transported in invasive. <laughs> and they were they were pretty well done. I set them for another three hours on a really low temperature to yeah. get them dry, dry. But you can have a good amount, well, actually. We have chanterelles at home. Yeah, I know. We I've have seen, red chanterelles. I, I've seen some people that uh, have have posted some some stuff about them. But yeah, you haven't had much luck finding them though, personally. Right? I haven't been out and done what we did. To make, look for them. Makes you want to though. Oh yeah, it does. If they're that good, oh, it's worth except it. in Texas in the summertime, just everything's there to bite you, sting you, or kill you in some other way, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the sun is there for sure. Yeah, 100, 110 degree hunting mushrooms. Yeah. Terrible. 
It would be cool if they actually glowed like jack lanterns because then you could go out at night <laughs> and find them and eat them. But well, actually, you don't well, you want can, the glowing You could use the jack lanterns as the indicator species. Have yeah. you ever heard of Foxfire? Do you want know Foxfire? Wasn't that a movie back in the 80s? Yes, there's very good possibility. There's also a series of books that are written about kind of woodsmanship stuff. It's really cool. Wood County, how Wood about County, that? Wood County, there you go. Uh, but uh, Foxfire is uh, its probably a common name for some stuff. Man, it's kind of flooded around here. Look at that barn. Yeah, recently mm. we were super dry for a while, and then all of a sudden we've gotten, well, you guys have been here, we've gotten bombed down on thunderstorms yeah, every we, day. Yeah, we, we stood underneath some tr trees trying to seek shelter for about 30 minutes the other That's day. That's going to be some good video. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to need to flood a urinal pretty yeah. soon, just by the way. So, <laughs> Anyways, uh, Foxfire is, it's a fungus. I think it's kind of like that dog puke stuff, you know what I'm talking about, dog puke fungus that you get in your garden. Um, but it's That's kind of got to be a Texas thing. It's like a slime fungus. Never heard, <laughs> never that. heard But that. It, it glows, it glows like that too, supposedly. Dog puke glows like that. No, it's not actually dog puke. They well, call it's it got to be named Ackley, no. right? It's got to look like dog puke if you. Yeah, name. I think maybe so. I mean, I don't know for sure. But anyways, I thought maybe you'd We're know what Foxfire edible. was, but <laughs> it probably is. Everything's edible at least once. That that's, sounds like that's a... the creed of the mushroom hunter. They've been trying. <laughs> Casey's been trying every berry we walked past. He tried a choke cherry first yeah. time. You didn't know what those were. No, really ch choked on it. There's not a lot. Well, I shouldn't say this on the podcast. I'm not. I'll say it this way. I'm not super concerned about dying from a berry in North America. However, I maybe should be. Um, so, but I was pretty confident that that was a choke cherry because I actually had phone servers, so I looked it up. Choke cherries are just like. Uh, a raw persimmon in cherry version. So don't eat those. However, we ate I just raw, ate a wild strawberry, which was kind of a sandy, watery type thing. Which I mean, it wasn't bad, but it's just not as good as a right. you know a store bought one. Uh, I tried wild raspberries, which are some of the best stuff you'll ever eat in your life. That's right. Mm -hmm. You can never find yeah. enough of those. Oh man, because yeah, we found both kinds. We found the black caps and, and the, the reds. reds. Yeah, yeah. Those reds that we they were in those apple trees. Those, they were so good. Those reds are what my when I was growing up, my grandma would make a pie. We we only find enough around our property to make one pie a year, and it's mm -hmm. one of the, my best childhood memories. Sounds good. Yeah. And then uh, tried some of the apples. Apples. Those, oh, yeah. Blueberries. Those, those apples were. I mean, they just didn't have the sugars, but they weren't bad. You know, they just weren't very good. You hit the blueberries though, and those oh, were. Oh man! And I think so we might have had some huckleberries in there too. The ones yeah, a little bit some redder. Kind of, Huckleberry looking thing. Those yep. things, that was better than blueberries. Those mm. huckleberry ones were bad. Yeah. Bad bone. But the weird part about the choke cherry and what you're saying is I know people that make choke cherry jam. So yeah. at some point that either gets ripe or you put enough sugar I, in it yeah, and it exactly. makes it good. That's it, right? <laughs> yeah. And, and a lot of times tannins disappear when you do certain processes yeah. to them. So maybe whenever you boil them, the tannin kind of goes away or whatever. Yeah. But I mean, people make rose hip jelly. I mean, yep. who cares to eat a rose you ever hip? put a rose hip in your mouth? I have. No, ain't the best tasting thing. Yeah, no, oh yeah. it's not that great. And, and talk about a mealy, but yeah. I, I don't, I don't get that. That doesn't. Mm. Is this so this is kind of way out there, but you've been in this country, and I want you to tell me what the names of these things are because the upland birds hammer them in Colorado. They're a short bush, about thigh high, and they have little white berries on them. So the white ones are winterberry. Winterberry. They're sugar. They're sweet as sugar. And uh, the other, there's another species out there that's called uh, silver buffalo berry, I believe. Uh -huh. um, SBBs. Uh, I, I, when you guys, when I release the second season of Way Up Land, we talk about it some because we're, we're biking through a lot of that. Are you that. still releasing that through our channel or what? We're talking about it. We're in negotiations. <laughs> Let's go, <Yeah>. baby. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that winter berry. Um, you know, sheep like that too, though. I was at a place in, in Colorado where they're, uh, you know, public ground always for me and um, for the most part of public access. And they, uh, the year I was there, ptarmigan like it. So mm -hmm. uh, I was in this specific, on the specific mountain hunting. There was winterberry on that mountain, and the ptarmigan were filled up with it. Mm -hmm. We just mm -hmm. hammered it. I go back the next year, and apparently the sheep lease had had had, uh, had re upped. Mm -hmm. The sheep had browsed that winterberry to the nubs. Not Talking a about domestic sheep. Yeah, not a single winterberry in the entire mountain, and not mm. a single ptarmigan. Well, I know a place uh, that shall not be disclosed that there is probably acres of that stuff, and there are always turkeys and, and blue grouse there. Oh in yeah, Colorado. Yeah. yeah. So do you have to like adjust 
like where you were headed uh, or like do some scouting on the map or like how did you figure out like where to go found, find birds whenever you kind of ran into that issue with the winterberry has been eaten well that's the problem with with terming and they either are where they are or they aren't where they aren't oh man um, that's such a not <laughs> hunting cliche I, I don't know <laughs> I, I, that's the only way to describe it. Got to like, be on the X, man. There, there's no, you, you you can't scout for them. I mean, I'd love to see you guys try. I'm all game for that. Well, anytime you want to do that, but the problem is you literally had to hike up to. We were at twelve seven, I think, yeah. is where we were. Mm -hmm. So when I'm that, founding Winterberry way lower than that. Did you know that that's uh, a thing? Yeah, but ptarmigan are. There's no ptarmigan there. Yeah. So. <laughs> what? Where did you find Winterberry in the state of Colorado? You mean? Oh yeah. At like uh, 8,300. White tail ptarmigan like it as high as they can go. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. There's no ptarmigan there, so. Might be, though. Might be. Do they taste better because of that sugar berry they're eating? You think? Uh, they taste good no matter what. Yeah. And it's, that's relative to how much work you put in, I think. I mean, when you're climbing to, you know, to one of those birds and then you put it, put that thing in your mouth on a campfire that evening you're like wow that's the best bird i've ever tasted but mm. it's probably a direct correlation to that's the hardest bird i've ever had to and not in terms of they're not real sketchy as far as shooting goes mm -hmm. i mean or you know dog work but they're sketchy um in terms of how much effort it takes to get to their country so uh, yeah it's the best tasting bird you ever put in your mouth because it's so, so it's, it's hard to scout ptarmigan it um, is but can you scout the other stuff like today or like when we were in Ohio or Pennsylvania, were you scouting for particular things or is it habitat? Is it food or habitat that you're looking for? Uh, depends on the bird. I'm looking for both, um, which is cool because you guys were talking about that on the on the map scout. You guys were talking about that on the map scout um, about the layers on that onyx, onyx. I on 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 cool? on X. I say on X. <laughs> but these guys, I don't know. They, every time I say it, they make fun of me. Um, the uh, the new layers stuff that they've got going on is the crop layer stuff. So it's crop layers, but yeah. it's also the cut layers, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. So you got that. so in terms of that, with the good, good. How are you? I got more. <laughs> So in terms of that, um, I'll wait till I get carpet. Are you embarrassed, Brian? Are you embarrassed, lady? She doesn't want to hear about tarpon again. I'm she gonna pee my pants. She might want to hear about tarpon. <laughs> She's a Steeler fan. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, so maybe in terms of tarpon, it's it's. I mean, Onyx doesn't have a winterberry layer. I'll put that in for you. Uh, yeah, put, the, put, put the winterberry order in for me. Um, so that makes it for tarming it. It's not ap applicable. So you can't mm -hmm. you can't uh, assume that when you get up to twelve thousand feet, there's going to be winterberry on any mountain. No, because one year I'm at. Um, that's a good point. Is on that specific mountain with the there was winterberry one year, and then the following year the sheep. There was no winter bird. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, got your browse So, but I, I, I can use it for other species of birds. Absolutely, I could use both those things, like food source and habitat and rough grouse, like we're talking about today. Yeah. Um, certainly could go that direction. Although rough grouse, I wouldn't be focusing on uh, food. I, I'd be focusing on cuts. So um, where we went in Ohio, there's really not much for upland hunting down there, right? There's no bobs, right? Yeah. And there's no pheasants really. They're, I mean, they release them, but you don't really want to participate in that. Yeah. So, but we were scouting around for whitetail stuff and whitetail food. And we found that stuff with, with layers and stuff. But then we're like, um, and that was kind of more of like a, I don't know, um, crop slash big or slash woodlot scenario. And then yesterday we went to Pennsylvania and we were kind of looking for the same type of habitat for both. And sometime, at sometimes at least, like you were talking about that, like um, I always want to say pre-emergent, but that's not the right word. It's early secessional. Early secessional. Early, secessional. Yes, yeah. early secessional growth is what you're looking for. That's right. Is that is that food or habitat or both? That's both for rough grouse. Yeah. Um, mainly because it's so thick. I mean, and for woodcock as well. Is that? Is I mean, that oh, we did see a woodcock. I, we did. I don't want to interrupt you. I want you to continue on. But when you say it's so thick, is that because 
all the rough grouse that live out there and the thin stuff are getting smoked by bobcats, so they just end up in the thick stuff, or do they truly like just live there only? It's it's exactly that. They're not, and I don't think they're getting smoked by bobcats. They're getting the the reason to to um, for grouse to to be in the early successional stuff and the thick stuff is because of raptors. I mean, oh, primarily, really? I mean, you know, uh, that's that's where the real the death from above is much much more uh We're talking about velociraptors right yeah exactly okay. so is it is it the uh grouse that survives by probability because that's where he was born and lives that lives in the thick stuff or is it the grouse that's smart enough to immigrate from the uh you know open woodland stuff to the uh early successional growth growth that you're finding? we're gonna have to ask the grouse on that one i mean if i were if i'm hypothesizing i think that it's yeah, generational, mm -hmm. multi, um, um, you know, generational, way generational, mm -hmm. and that the the best learned behavior is the one rewarded in nature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, like the the, the grouse have, have learned or, or there's that's an interesting topic. So we'll go, I'll go to pheasant and and Kansas. You guys, you know, I hunt Kansas. We only oh. talk about natives on this podcast. I know. Well, we, you know, pheasants forever would say that pheasants are now native okay um but um, well, well there's a term for that right they've uh naturalized isn't that what it's called I, i've never heard it uh, used in terms of animals i've never yeah. heard it used in terms of people oh really naturalized citizens yeah but that is an interesting term okay i'm gonna start using that yeah now. i think that would work because it's less offensive to people yeah but we've always had a theory in kansas where me and my friends and my dad have joked about kansas and that the pheasant in kansas is an entire different subspecies <laughs> <laughs> that's what you actually say yeah we do um because uh if you don't hunt kansas on opening week what you find is is that the rooster pheasant the ones that are the most successful are the ones that refuse to fly uh -huh. i mean they just they don't fly and so our running joke is is that at some point a kansas pheasant is going to lose its wings because <laughs> it, they just don't. Uh, the, the successful ones aren't using them, mm -hmm. right? Is a is a pheasant have because you talk about this a lot. Seventy percent of upland game die every year, and they repopulate that year. That's yeah. kind of the that's, that's kind that's of the right. rough factor. Yeah. The I'm annual sure mortality rate. by species it makes a difference. By but. species and by and by uh, what's going on with weather and everything yeah. else. But yeah, lots of factors. But it's uh, somewhere between seventy and eighty percent, honestly. Yeah. yeah. So is our pheasants in that or do they, are they a little bit more longer lived no they're they're definitely a prime example of uh, that they're that uh average pheasant mortality easily above 70 percent mm -hmm. uh, uh we know this because pheasant um when you when you shoot a pheasant murder pheasant <laughs> i i was about to say harvest and i'm now i'm working on my words what about, i what gotta about, work on my words i have a question can we use the term individually extirpate <laughs> That's long. It's hard. That one's hard to hard to grasp. I'm not offended by any term that that that. that well, I, you're going to find a term that I'll be offended by. So, anyways, when you shoot a pheasant and you bring it to hand, you can tell very easily the difference between a young, a juvie bird, a first year bird, mm -hmm. and a, a three year old, which is the uh, which is the anomaly. And then I'm sure somebody has shot a four year old bird, but when you have a uh, one-year-old bird and a three-year-old bird side by side it's like it's night and day mm -hmm. um, uh, body weight wise tail length certainly which is what a lot of guys would, would measure you know a bird. did you see like two years ago I'm sure we sent it to you but uh, the DNR from a certain state uh, reposted this like can you believe the tail feather on this bird and it was one of those you know stupid doubled two up. tail feathers double up thing and they thought it was real <laughs> yeah that, you remember that? I, I, yeah we talked about yeah, that i think yeah. i thought it was real so yeah. it looked pretty good it looked good it, yeah, yeah they, did, they did good <laughs> but you um, think a dnr would be better at that but um they're really really not <laughs> they're really, the, across the board we're gonna we're, that'll take us down a path that's the, we'll, this podcast that's right. will go for 14 hours we'll do that one on the way home <laughs> um, the, 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 yeah if we want to start in on conservation dnr then oh god right. well i don't even know where that goes but um, the other thing about it, what I, I even beyond tail length on a on a very mature pheasant, the thing that we that I'm really looking for are mm -hmm. the silver tips yeah. on the spurs. You know, a uh, 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 mature, uh, super mature, three year old pheasant, 
besides having a really long tail and heavier body weight, is going to have these these spurs that have white tips on them. We call them ivory tips, mm -hmm. and it's, it's just rare. So maybe uh, that's a one percent bird, less than one percent bird. A three per, uh, uh, a three year old pheasant, you know, to survive one year is you're only gonna you're only gonna get that chance about twenty five percent of the time. Mm -hmm. Um. Oh no! We, oh, got, we got we got hosed on the reentry. The roots oh, closed. No, that's not good. <laughs> that's, that, that was not that was not well planned out as a pit stop. We're gonna find a we're gonna find a worker. Um, hmm, we could we could make it. We we could make it happen. Some people have been cutting across. So do you, you ever cut the spurs off pheasant? Uh, no, I. Uh, I keep my hides. I generally don't cut spurs off pheasant. Although I, I bet there's some guys. What if have. you had a pheasant spur necklace? You seen them guys that do that for turkey? Turkeys, yeah. Uh, that's cool, man. <laughs> or for hogs' teeth and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I got some for javelina Cutters. teeth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What noise does a javelina make? Oh, you don't want to mm -hmm. hear it. It's no, loud. If, if you do it, if you do it, I will hit I'll, you. I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's the it's the loudest thing you've ever heard it's in your a, life. It's a very velociraptor type noise. Yeah. I mean, I've, they, I've seen them before. I uh, mean, bird hunting. Dude. I believe. I truly believe <laughs> oh that gosh. is the meanest wild animal that there is. They are. I'm telling you, the temperament of a javelina is the worst thing. I I, I was camped out on top of a mountain in West Texas. We were catching elk in a pen. Uh, and we're gonna have these, to backtrack. These javelinas ran through our camp and woke us up. And when we got up, they were surprised. So then they tried to like charge at us to get us to leave. <laughs> Luckily, my buddy had. I mean, I don't think they would have killed us, you know. But like, either way, it was nice that my friend had. You get your femoral. Yeah, they could. And they are, they have some sharp teeth. You think yes. hog, hog tusks are sharp? Goodness gracious, Havelina teeth are ridiculous. You could have speared one and got canceled. I, I didn't have any spears. <laughs> canceled? But uh, my buddy had a... Uh, From your I primary he, sponsor. He uh, had, okay. a, he had a judge, <laughs> like a a, um, a Taurus judge or whatever they're called. They shoot 14, 14. shells. Yeah. 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 He had that thing. He just went to shoot in amongst them, and uh, they ran off after that. But... <laughs> Uh, then, you know, we were on a having a vendetta and, and shot a few the next day. And, like, you'd shoot one, and it'd go to make that, that crazy javelina noise. And then the other ones would just attack it, almost like chickens do or turkeys do whenever another one gets shot. Mm, and they go, it was, it was, they're wild, dude. Why do you think turkeys do that? Um, I'm sure it's a survival instinct. Well, their brain is so small, they're easily deceived. They're mad yeah. about their deception. Right. That, <laughs> that, that, that flopping around makes that turkey think it's a decoy. Yep. I, yeah. I shot a coyote one time with a bow, and KC was with me. Oh, man, that was bad. We were on public land in Texas. I shot a coyote with a bow, and it was the last one I've ever shot. And um, he ran off, like, 60 yards. He's with a pack of, like, three others, I think. And uh, then just proceeded to, I guess, get attacked by the rest of them for the yeah. for the next hour. Yeah, it, it was. was, it was, it was I, I was said, like, okay, I'm not shooting any more things sad like that. I tree stand after that. I learned soft. my lesson, Brian. Yeah, learned yeah. my lesson. Um, We've got an alliance with the I mean, coyote as well, by the way. Chickens. Do yeah. you've seen this probably? But like, if you get a hen chicken that gets like kind of messed up or something, like the other chickens will peck it, yeah. kill it. Yeah, it just birds I mean, are mean creatures. They're mean. Dude. They are, dude. They are. They are mean they for sure, are. but. Yeah. That's why I go after them, primarily because they're so mean. Yeah. So we're going uh, the opposite way now? Well, right? <laughs> after that stop, we're now no longer headed to Michigan. We're going to be map scouting, let's see. Uh, Bass Pro Shops. Southern Ohio here in Good. a hot second. <laughs> so um, we are actually are headed to Michigan like we talked about a little while ago. We're I think we're pretty close to Michigan right now, aren't we? Yeah, we, we're, we're in Toledo right now. We're about to turn around at this big Bass Pro Shop. Shout out yeah. Bass Pro Ooh. Shops. Hit, yep. hit us up if you want to be a sponsor. Me, primarily. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, all it takes to be sponsor of Bass Pro is to just go film a segment in the parking lot before you go I, on your hunt. I think that's right. I think we should do that for you. You know, uh, Johnny's a pretty big proponent of conservation, from what I understand. Private uh, conservation. Uh, he spends a lot of money on it, from what I understand. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. What do you think about Brian? Brian's a skeptic. I, I, I got a hot take, and I'm not going to share it. Thank good. You. That's perfect, man, because that's a good way to not get sponsored. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so. Um, oh, we just got another person signing up for the Hagerman dang. scouting stuff that we're going to do. So, real quick plug, while I'm thinking about it, since I just got the notification, uh, we're doing a um, 
basically just kind of like an in-person scouting section se uh, session sorry on the Hagerman National Wildlife Refuge here in North Texas or there in North Texas and we're not there um, and if you want to be a part of that you can go to our website go to the shop and you can buy a ticket and crew uh, Chad Rice from Cruiser Saddles will be there and he will be um, uh, kind of giving a demo of how to run a saddle, what to think about when you set up a saddle, and probably letting some guys get in and test some of the saddles. So if you're interested in that, uh, small ticket price helps us to rent a room at a hotel so that we can all get in the out of the heat Ooh. after the morning of scouting, and we can uh, do some map scouting after we've been on the property to talk about other places that might be good there. So if you're thinking about hunting the Hagerman, which a lot of these Texas guys are, uh, that follow us, um, there it's a good chance to uh, all put our brains together and help each other be successful out there. Yeah, and maybe gear. just uh, learn a little bit about whitetail scouting in general. I think the reason that we were going to go do the the Hagerman thing is because it's a place um, that whitetails most likely lay down a lot of sign. Yeah, and a little uh, more whitetail like. Yeah, yeah, it's a little bit more. Uh, Less pressure. Of course, controlled hunt. So uh, they control the hunting pressure there. So whitetail are going to do more whitetail type stuff and leave more signs. So um, I think it's a good opportunity for us to get out there. What part of Texas is identify. that in? North Texas. So near Sherman, Texas. North of DFW. I'm doing that thing where now where I get mm -hmm. indigestion that Tyler talks about. So uh, <laughs> it's fun to edit. It's yeah, fun it's, to edit stand it's, interviews. That's when right. That's <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> Anyways, I'm excited about that, man. I think it's going to be a good time, and uh, I think that um, we'll probably do some Q&A stuff, of course, with that, and, and maybe uh, have somebody else show up and tell, help us learn some stuff. Yeah, too. you also get a free shirt if you buy the ticket, so yeah. you get to pick a, a shirt when you're there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, right now we are headed to Michigan. We've been trying to get to this topic, but there's all these little side trips we keep taking, right? Uh, like, we are uh, yeah. definitely shiny objects, Andrew. Not yep. even figurative side trips. Like, we literally just went to the side to go pee for Tyler, and then and now <laughs> we made a little detour. Hey, there's Bass Pro again. Or is hey, that a different one? I don't know. Um, so, <laughs> Charlie's um, still there. You said this morning that Michigan is rough grouse central. You said there's a lot of rough grouse up here. There, there are, um, which is a blue grouse, right? <laughs> no, no, rough grouse is its own thing. Okay, it can't get a blue grouse pregnant. Can it not? Ooh, is there a possibility that there's a hybrid rough grouse, rough grouse, blue grouse out? There? Is that are, so? Here's are one grouse of those things. Pregnant, that, or do they just have eggs inside of them? That's a good question. <laughs> I suppose they're pregnant for a little bit, but uh, so are they? A species because of a geographic boundary or because of genetic difficulties in reproduction. You know what I mean? Like, well, uh, what level of a scientific name can impregnate another level of a scientific name? I think that's dependent on the on the critter. Because, dude, a donkey and a zebra can have a baby. Yeah, but they've got to they've got to share some level of scientific name. Well, right? sure. I, mean, I don't think they share a level level of name. I think you're probably talking about taxonomy here. So I don't think that a um, the genus of zebra is the same thing as the genus of donkey because zebra is a genus in itself because there's multiple species of zebra. So does the donkey find the zebra attractive or does the zebra find the donkey attractive? You have to ask them. I think the donkey uses his genus to make this happen. I'm so, not sure. Back to back to rough grass in Michigan. Uh, we're headed up here, and we're going to kind of scout some of the same type of stuff, right, for this deal. I mean, of course, we're going for a white till, uh, you know, map scout challenge, but you're going to be looking for rough grouse stuff and mushrooms while we're running around. Surely. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, um, yeah I think that that's uh, – well, I'll be looking for cuts. You know, it's the same thing that we, we were hoping – or I was hoping to see over in Allegheny. And, and the weird part about Allegheny is my definition of cut um, – it versus what I know as a fairly standard definition in Michigan, which when you talk about cuts in Michigan, there, Michigan is a very large timbering state. Yeah, they're um, into the clear cut. They they cut cut. Yeah. Um, and the stuff we saw over in the forest, not that it was all this way, but, you know, because we, we saw a fraction. 
-hmm. We saw a fraction of mm -hmm. that. Allegheny, for those of you that don't know, is this massive resource. You should go there. It's absolute. I was amazed by me it. Too. Oh, me too. Me too. Um, but the the cuts that we were at, they were select harvest. Yeah. And I don't know that there. And so uh, Onyx didn't really differentiate between those two things. I don't think. Right. Yeah. No. So, I think that'd be pretty difficult to do because yeah. I'm sure that's just on the company books. About is that that's about what it is. Yeah. I'm yeah. Pretty sure. Yeah. So I think you're right. But so when we were when we were walking in, I was thinking we were going to clear cuts that were six, seven, eight years old, mm -hmm. and really it turns out they were pretty much select cuts, Yeah, and they still had a lot of very well-established hardwood in there, and that wouldn't be stuff that I'd be going towards as a rough grouse hot spot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what, what about over here where um, you have areas that may seasonally flood, and that's going to prevent hardwoods from growing, but you might have some smaller type early successional stuff that kind of comes and goes is that also rough grouse habitat it can't i've hunted some swamp grouse before yeah it's really difficult how did you love it um I, I it's funny in some regards um shout out Brittany booth uh she's she showed me the uh first time we went swamp grouse hunting uh she went in up to her waist and in a pothole i mean like you know super Beaver run it was bad yeah. stuff man um but we did shoot a bird back in there. That's um, cool. So they're they're in there. Swamp pheasants are a thing too, right? I guess maybe not in Michigan, but like yeah. they, they like those cattail marshes, right? Uh, yeah, that's the uh, part of the reason that, um, in my view, um, you, somebody could probably argue against this. The biologist might say you're a lunatic, but in um, South Dakota, there's uh, and North Dakota, there's so much pothole region where mm -hmm. it, it's surrounded by cattails, mm -hmm. and those pheasant. If you if you've been in those cattails in the wintertime, you can understand why those why pheasant go in there. First of all, nothing can go anywhere close to those pheasants without them being able to hear the approach. Yeah, it's loud. It's loud, loud. That mm -hmm. stuff's super dry, mm -hmm. and it also is a probably a ten degree. Uh, raise in temperature really? just from the insulation of that of the mm, cattails so that's why uh, up there in my view they have a a, a fairly good static that in, base in the winter those uh cattails kind of fold over and make tents almost and there's like little holes for little things to holes get if you, you yeah. and you if you go into those things to pursue um, birds in the winter time when there's snow on the ground you'll see that you'll see mm -hmm. their tracks and they're going in under those little it's a little pheasant igloo yeah do you yeah. so what like what we're going to do today do you consider that uh part of the process of uh the hunt which you love the process is this something that like is fun for you or is it just something you're kind of just doing as you're tagging along here yeah, it's fun to see new areas. Um, yeah. For me, though, the scouting-wise, I don't d tend to. I don't tend to go to destination states to scout prior to the season mm -hmm. in person. Um, I look at weather data for the year and uh, emergency hanging and cropping data for the year, and then. Um, I kind of base it off of that and then just my general knowledge mm -hmm. of, uh, uh, of bird behavior, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, that's, that's, that's one of the things that's different because you guys are up here, you know, scouting. And, you know, I think, well, the Ohio map scout that you're, you guys are, you know, getting ready to release or release sometime in the near future, you know, you think you narrowed in on where I guess, I mean, I guess you guys are saying that there's a big buck that you think you may have, like, honed in on, or well, at least a home range, I guess. Is that what you would you know, say? In Ohio? Yeah. Uh, I think there's a good chance. Yeah. yeah. So, but you, you expect that, you expect that animal to be in that general vicinity, like, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. And with Kane with cameras i mean the, the you guys are using the moultrie stuff right yeah mm -hmm. yeah the, we actually hung a cell cam there on uh, on a bean field expecting to get pictures of a deer that we found signed for in the hardwoods you know that because yeah. that's going to be kind of the the food source or whatever this time of year mm -hmm. so what would be us. the what would be the trigger to trip that that and go okay then we're going back there to hunt like what's the what would be the determining factor on but that see i think that's Ohio. the huge difference in upland and uh whitetail is that we're looking for a specific animal you're usually looking for a population of animals that's right i mean in some regards I, I was just trying to figure i was trying to segment out exactly what you know and that was public land too so yep. there's going to be other guys that are going to have the sure. ability to hunt mm -hmm. in there as well and, so and maybe that's the other thing too it's not just a specific animal but maybe there is a echelon 
that we're trying to achieve of multiple animals that make that. You know what I mean? So maybe it's it's age class, kind of getting back to the maturity thing that we we're talking about, or antler size. You know, you have if you pick up five deer on a piece of public property off of one camera that are all uh, let's you know go with scoring system because uh, it actually is an accurate gauge of maturity across the board. So if you go with something that is you know a 125 Boone and Crockett class deer and you have seven of those across the board, there's a good chance that you have quite a few older age class deer there to hunt. Whereas if you hang a camera three miles from there, you have one of that. It's like man, that's not that's not that. That ain't the that ain't the, that so ain't the move. You know. What's the what's the that, that I just like the move. The, what's the move? What's no. the. <laughs> <laughs> So there's inside jokes that nobody's getting. I love it. So what's the um, so what's the bottom barrier for Ohio specifically? Let's just, I just want to talk spe- Ohio specifically because well, that's, that's going to kind of depend because when we do the map scout challenge stuff, it's it's for the public, so it's not really a place that we're going to go back and hunt. Now, if there's a 287 that shows up there, we're probably not going to tell anybody about it. But for the most part, that's the idea. Is it's it's more for public information, not so that people can go there and hunt those specific deer because that would be silly. But the idea is to go and show as much of the habitat and as much of the country and kind of the demographic and breakdown of you know ag to timber to swamp and yada yada to give people an idea of how to scout for whitetails in that country and then what you're going to find in an area that looks similar to that so that they can apply that to their own uh, places that they either hunt locally or when they travel out of state. Mm-hmm. So, um, But if a 200 shows up on camera, yeah, you're he, showing the, you, you, well, you've already, the people are going to see the spot, right? Yeah. What if, you sh- what if the 200 shows up after the fact? Uh, I don't, I don't think we'll release it until then. <laughs> so, uh, when do these come out? That's a good. That's a good. I like that. Yeah, I mean, probably August. I yeah, probably yeah. something. We we released uh, we we released Map Scout challenges last year that had big deer in them. Like big deer, 150 yeah. plus yep. inch deer. You know. Yeah. So two two different places. Missouri. We did one in Missouri that had a big big deer on it, big ten point, mm-hmm. and then one in Illinois in Shawnee that was. You know, I think it was a big nine with some kind of junky bases or something. Yeah, Maybe. and there was another really good deer in that on that camera as well. Deer that any of us would love to kill. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. And I think that um, you know we can almost expect as much in Ohio in a good spot. But who knows if that happens? You yeah. know, um, and I don't know. I think in Tennessee. I mean, sorry, in Pennsylvania, we're looking at something that's quite a bit smaller that'll probably show up and be will be stoked about. You know, but we got a good spot over there. And then in, here in Michigan, I think it's really going to be a uh, kind of a, I don't know, I, I don't know what to expect, because like we were saying earlier, like it's kind of where it all started, we'll kind of wrap it up on that, but like, it's a, a weird deal, because they have the genetics and, you know, the crops, and it's northern latitudes, so they're, the potential for big deer are there, you know, it's like, it's a thing that can happen, um, but are there going to be enough limiting factors to make it not happen? And I'm assuming that's what you're looking at. Like, you know, South Dakota has the potential for really good upland hunting. But the limiting factors of drought and emergency hay grazing and yada yada might make it to where it doesn't really have that this year, right? And I think that um, just like we were talking about how with upland birds, you know, uh, since 70% of the birds die every year and they repopulate, you live on a very year-to-year basis on what's good and what's not. In in our world, the year-to-year doesn't happen as much. It's it's uh, almost generationally, you know. Like um, 20 years ago, there were parts of Illinois that were just the baddest places in the world to hunt whitetails, and now that information has gotten out, and it's not really what it used to be, or at least that's what people like to say, you know. And, and that's probably a whole nother rabbit hole to dive down into but you kind of get what i'm saying um if we get if we go scout a place and it doesn't look very good it's probably not going to be very good next year either but that's not to say that in five or ten years whenever things change around there yeah it couldn't be i mean that's uh, that's definitely a different with upland there and that's why um folks can write articles going these are the best places to go upland hunting and they're they're using uh, they're also using a meter that doesn't necessarily apply to what i do so yeah what's best right yeah 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 what's best um uh 
I don't I don't really care that much about the number of birds I shoot. What I and partly what I like to do, honestly, is I like to something I've done historically is I like to find places where people don't expect there to be birds mm -hmm. and then dig one out. I find that satisfying in some regard to go someplace where they're just like there's no way you're gonna see something there and oh make it happen. So if, if that is the case, since you've spent some time walking around in Texas public with us, is there a part of you that wants to go down there and hunt Bob Whites and try to make it happen? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I, we've already talked about it. I mean, it's just, you know, where do we fit it in? What about Bigfoots? You Not don't. Bigfoots, but... There's a lot of people that don't expect Bigfoots to be a real thing. <laughs> Chakalaka Forever, the, that new <laughs> conservation organization. That's yeah. Right. <laughs> is um, Chuckalaka Forever? They those guys ha are 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 onto something there. Yeah, they are. yeah. They, the, the range of the Chuckalaka is expanding. Well, Man, I, as far as I know, all you need is some fire on the landscape and birds will go nuts, right? Yeah, yeah. that's all it takes, dude. That's all. If it you takes. want a turkey, you burn a spot, and he'll be there. Hey, let's just plant. <laughs> <laughs> an acre of habitat. It don't matter where. It doesn't matter what's around it. No, you if, can't if we're plant the it. If we're the habitat organization, you can't plant it. You have to save it. Save the habitat. You know, if we're the that. habitat organization, our uh, acronym is HO. Just so you know, <laughs> that's about uh, habitat app. organization of the element. <laughs> that is app. Yeah. So um, we are about in Michigan, and I think we are to the point where we are going to start being a little bit crazy. So I think it's a good time to kind of wrap this thing up, guys. If you enjoy this kind of stuff, be sure and subscribe to what Brian has going on over yeah. at Ultimate Upland. He's really, I know we were tooting his horn for him because he doesn't like to do it. Um, but uh, he does some really, really awesome stuff. Uh, I mean, things that I'm not willing to even do. So the only way, if you're the same kind of person, uh, the only way you can enjoy such things is to go, you know, see what he writes and what he uh, puts out there video content-wise and whatnot. So, uh, dude, I really do appreciate how much you have done for us on this trip. Honestly, if we haven't had you to help us do the Map Scout Challenge stuff, with, with Map Scout Challenge stuff, both with local knowledge and just, you know, a place to stay with hospitality and then quality meals to refuel us every night you know like i don't think that uh a this would be way less enjoyable but b like i don't think that we would be as effective or efficient so we might not even be here yeah we might not <laughs> honestly we very well might not be in, up in, in here up well, in here, I'm, up <laughs> in here. <laughs> I'm just real appreciative of the fact that you guys are teaching me how to say things yeah. like, oh absolutely that's up in that's, here. that's what up i love you here. know having up you guys up here, here. y'all gonna make me, me lose my mind <laughs> <laughs> all right so the 2022 what are we teaching you what by the way What's the what's the best thing we've taught you? Uh, apparently, I have problems with O's. Yeah. Anything with O's in it, and I can't say your name, which I'm not exactly sure because I thought I said Tyler, but apparently that's not how you no, say it's, Tyler. It's not. You were trying to really put a southern emphasis on the way you said it just then. Brian is chameleonic. I thought you were going to say voice. my name. My last name was Junes. Junes. <laughs> John's. <laughs> no, I, well, and that may be how your daughter pronounces it. No, she doesn't. But yeah, I, uh, <laughs> my O's are. I, I need to work on my O's if I'm going to become a podcaster. Are you? Then I have to work on my O's. Wait a second. Are hey. you going to be, become a podcaster? I, I don't know. I hear it's the way to get very popular. We we should at least think about it for sure. Yeah, we should think about that. Well. Anyway, subscribe to Brian's new podcast. It's going to be called uh, The Season. Ultimate Way to <laughs> Be an Uplander. Um, <laughs> but for real, like a go to, what is it? It's ultimateupland.com. Ultimate Upland all the time. Yeah, everywhere. Yeah, everywhere. And, uh, and check out what he's got going on. Be sure to check out the Map Scout Challenges on YouTube. We have a playlist there from the 2020 versions of those. We went to a lot of really cool states for that. we got the 2021 ones coming out pretty soon. If you haven't yet, Go sign up for the Element Scouting Session in August. And while you're on our website, oh, that's where you sign up for that, by the way. You mm -hmm. go to the website. You can uh, you can pay for that there at the, the shop on our website, theelementwild.com. While you're there, buy your shirt for you and your friends. And uh, be sure and subscribe to this podcast as well. And remember also that this is your element. Live in, in. it. <laughs> <laughs> Live in it.